So I felt the Lord uh, directing me after this week for us to uh, get together and actually have, um, I guess for lack of a better term, kind of like I got this hat given to me on the way in here tonight, so I'm kind of excited to wear it. Um, uh, we're going to have a, kind of a story time. Remember when you were kids and you'd have story time? It's the best part of school, right? Story time. And so I'd like to start with a little story. Then Bobby's going to get up and tell his story. Then Chuck's going to get up and his tell his story. Then I'm going to get up and tell my story. We've got a 15-minute time limit. If someone wants to go ding, 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 that's okay. You don't need to know everything. That's the other thing. Is just don't think you need to tell every detail just to tell your story. And how I think the Lord's going to use this is, is we're going to want to begin to work with every uh, man that we're blessed to have uh, in our Act Like Men Recovery Houses here at Rock Bottom and in the other locations. And we're going to want to have us just working on our story. How can you get to somewhere else till you know where you are and how you got here? Now, every really good story begins or has these three elements. My life before, the crisis, and my life afterward. And I hope that your story includes a God meeting you uh, at that crisis and making all the difference. If that hasn't happened for you yet, I pray that it happens in the future. And I'd like to start off by reading you one of those before um, crisis and after stories from the Bible. It's from Luke chapter 15, and many people are familiar with this story. It's called the story of the prodigal son. Now, as I read it, I want you to listen to what was he like, what changed it all, and what was his life like afterwards, okay? You track with me? You're looking super strong with those sunglasses on in here. I'm a big fan of sunglasses indoors. You're crushing it right now. If we didn't bring we didn't bring a cool award tonight, Max, but if we did, I promise you, you'd be winning. Okay, everybody with me? Love you. Glad you're here. Here it is. There was a man who had two sons. This is all the words of Christ. He told this story. There was a man that had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father. Father, I should put this in a whiny voice because this is the way he was. Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. He divided his and he divided his property between them. Now, really what he's demanding is his inheritance. Now, when you say to somebody, when do you get your inheritance, by the way? When they, die. when they what? When they die. Right. So when you go to somebody who's still living and saying, give me my inheritance now, what are you really saying to them? I wish you were. But the father, probably pretty deeply wounded, says he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he, listen up, there he, he wasted or squandered his property in reckless living. Anybody ever squandered their property in reckless living? Yeah. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. See, that's always what happens, right? It seems like a great idea. Then you find out your hands are empty and you got nothing, and then the need comes. In fact, his need was so great, it says that he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. So first he was living like a pig, and now he's living with the pigs hmm. living like a pig living with the pigs isn't that how it goes and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and this is when you come to the end and no one gave him anything that's when the end comes no, no, don't call me no more i'm not helping you again we're not doing another round of this you're destroying all of us that end. Hard words to hear. No one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, why? Because the story's always going south when we're not thinking clearly. But when he came to himself, what? How did I get here? He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, Here's the change. I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Better than this. Better than feeding pigs and wanting to eat the food. He arose and he came to his father. 
And here's the awesome thing. The story that Jesus told is about how God the Father loves all of us. And far from standing like this, like, look at the mess you made in your life. Look at the awful choices you've made. The first message I ever preached when I planted a church in 1988, I called the sermon, The Day God Ran, because God is the Father in this story that Jesus was telling. And watch what the Father does when he sees the Son coming home. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, <laughs> this is so awesome, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate for my, this my son was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. And they began to celebrate. Isn't that awesome? And that's how God feels about every one of us in our lost condition. And we're going to have uh, Bobby come now and tell his story about uh, before and what God did in his life and since. So let's all give a big hand for Bobby Gentile. We love this guy. So I, I came into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, September 9th of 2009, and my uh, sobriety date is January 15th of 2012. So that will tell you that things weren't perfect from the start and uh, still aren't today, right? But today I can tell you that uh, I'm drug and alcohol free, and thank God for that. So um, before, you know, to do this in 15 minutes, I got to be pretty, pretty... Uh, undynamic so the before you know I grew up I was an adopted I was adopted from a young age and so a lot of that um, I didn't think weighed on me too much but there was certainly some of that that played a role um, and I played sports and so I was really really good at sports and so no matter what I did as I was getting older no matter what I did I could get in trouble I could do anything and everybody's you know just kind of brushed it off brushed it off you know and I was always told you know that I'm gonna play pro sports and I'm gonna do this and play baseball and all this stuff and and uh, so basically it was just a lot of enabling as I look back um, and my parents were awesome my, my, my birth parents are the parents that I consider my mom and dad who are both past today uh, they were wonderful wonderful parents to me so there's no excuses at my home for how I turned out um, the things I did or any of those things. And um, <coughs> I could see from an early on now looking back that I really led a selfish, self-centered, self-seeking life. Um, you know, I loved my friends. I always talked about my friends. I would talk about being there for them. I would, I, and, I, and I was, um, but there was always this aspect of if I do for you, I kind of expect something back. Right. And those those favors would end up getting called as time comes on. Some some would be good. Some would not. Are you looking at the clock already right now? Is that a clock on the wall? Holy cow. I'm getting counted down already. Um, <laughs> so I would tell you that uh, I had a great upbringing. I really did. I had a great upbringing. And, um, um, you know, it wasn't until I was probably and it's hard for me to think now. Um, probably 16, 17, I mean, so older into it, that I even had my first cigarette, you know. Um, I was playing sports all that time, so really I just didn't, never did. And um, But this will show you how addictions work, because as soon as I ended up doing some of those things, it was constant. So if I was smoking, now I'm smoking, right? And, and the first time I, I tried a, I tried a, a drugs, where's my daughter? I forgot she's in here. <laughs> um, it was constant, you know, and it was something that I really enjoyed, and it was something that that filled the hole. You know, I heard someone speak, and and uh, and if I cry, I do all the time. And uh, it's a family member of of Sal's, and she spoke at the Anona Club one time, and she said the first time I picked up a drink, it was like the biggest hug in the world was given to me. And, uh, you know, I played this role like nothing bothered me. And I played this thing like I was larger than life. And I played it out in many different ways in high school with my friends and all of that stuff. 
But there was something that was deficient in me. I just, you know, to look back, there was something that was missing. And I really didn't know who I was, right? And I had this false identity that I was playing into. So, you know, like my dad, he was, uh, you know, it was in a, there was a whole huge Italian theme in my life. And I grew up with Italian father and some of the, you know, even some of the outfit guys, right? But I took that on as that's who I was. Um, wholeheartedly. I remember even in the beginning, I would tell people I'm 100% Italian. You know what I mean? I, I'm definitely not. But but the point is, but that's the kind of entity I took on. Um, and so getting into the to the scene of drinking and hanging out with my with the friends at the time, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't wonder why everybody would go home at night and I would be simply like, well, what's going on? I mean, what are we doing next? And uh, that ended up playing out into major, major ways as I went through my addictions and got older. So much time. I'm going to have to do this again with at least an hour, by the way. <laughs> um, and so it just, it just kind of snowballed, right? And that's what I became. I became into that. So it, it, I got into the drugs. I got into the alcohol. I lost many opportunities as I was going through. Um, I ended up in jail. I ended up in, in many, many times. You know, I would get bonded out like this every single time. I mean, they used to call me the Godfather. So when I would get arrested, my father would be at the police station before I could even get there and bonded me out and bonded me out. And that's just the way it was until it wasn't able to be done no more that way. Right. And even my lawyers and stuff would look at me and say simple things like, you can't call me no more. I pulled every favor I can pull. Um, and things started to weigh down a little bit. So I ended up in prison a few times. Um, I ended up in jails many times. Um, and at that time, it was almost like a badge of honor, I guess. You know, and it's like, oh, I can do this time standing on my head. To look back, I don't even know why I said those things. It's like, okay, then go ahead. <laughs> you know, um, what happened for me was real simple. I remember I was always big on respect and uh, it was the last thing I was holding on to in my life was that um, I told all my friends, you know, I may not be around, I may be off doing this, but if you called me in the middle of the night, three in the morning, you know who's going to be there. I remember saying that to one of my best friends. You know who's going to be there. It's the last thing I could hold on to because everything else was in shams. And uh, so I remember it was one night, and I won't go into the whole story, but at the end of the night, he basically called me and says, Bob, I need you to come over here. And I was just three sheets to the wind. I had already screwed up the whole night between me and him, and he kind of just knew. And um, and he said, I need you to come over here and watch my kids. I got to go to the hospital with my wife, you know? And I'm like, okay, I'll be right there. And if anybody knows, you know, like when I was in that mode and I had done a lot of harder drugs, I keep looking for my daughter. I don't want to name her, but, um, and thank God that she's a girl that's never seen me use anything, right? So, that's I mean, right. she's nine years old and awesome. she's never had to see her father do any of this stuff. Um, but it was an awakening for me that night. I mean, he made it very clear. He, he put me on the spot. He says, well, if that's what you're about, then come on over here and, and, and I need you. And I drove, I, I drove around his block a hundred times because I just certainly wasn't in the mind frame to even go to that house. But I didn't want to not go. And so eventually I just left and went home. And it crushed me, right? It just ripped my heart out because all these years, all these lies I had told myself, everything, every day was a lie to myself to keep it going. And here, this thing that I thought was so true was so not. And there was a time and place that I wouldn't be there. And I couldn't be there. And as much as I wanted to be there, I shouldn't be there in all of these things. So at that point, you know, I remember asking somebody, I says, uh, you know, what did you do to get sober? And uh, I had a friend of mine, and I would tell you, the I didn't know at the time, but I look back today, and this was the Lord working in my life. And let me just say this, that there were so many situations in my life previous to even throughout that, that chaos that I was a guy that I'd say, oh, what a coincidence. I'd get out of jail. What a coincidence. Oh, yeah, you know, it's just, you know, I, I never talked about God's favor. I never talked. It was coincidence, <laughs> coincidence, coincidence. And I had a lot of those in my life. Um and then getting to this point where I had realized um, I need help. You know, I need help. And I was a guy that did not like to ask for help. Um, I was the help, right? I you know, lived my life that way. Some of the business, some of the things I did even for work, I thought I was helping others by, um, 
I needed help. And so he said, I, you know, go talk to, I forget her name now, I can't believe it, but at LSSI. And I went over there and I talked to her and she explained the mind of alcoholism, right? And how it works and the receptors. And listen, I had been a drug addict for a long time. These were, these were conversations that were beyond me, right? I mean, we had surface level things going on on a daily. And here she's blowing my mind with, I might not be so different than another. And that this is how our brains work. And I says, well, you know, and, and at the end of it, I says, so what do I do now? She says, you just keep coming back. She says, you come here four times a day. They put me in intensive outpatient. And, um, and I started my journey there. And so starting with God, you know, was in this program. And I had a relationship with God previously. My father would take us to church and stuff, but I was just, how fast could I get out of there? And at this point, you know, the AA was taking me through the steps and, um, and I was reading these and I didn't get it, you know, and, and I think the most important thing is like, you know, in step one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. And I remember my sponsor came to me and he said to me, All right, read this and come back and let's talk about it. And I read it for like a week or two and I just didn't get it. I did not understand it. There was no difference in my thinking. And I went back to him and I says, I just really don't get it. And I was kind of upset at this because I had now made a decision that I needed help. I knew I was reeling off. I mean, I was going to die at some point. There was no doubt. Um, and so I, I didn't want it to not make sense, but it just wasn't making sense. And uh, I brought it back to him and he says, well, read it to me. And I says, you know, I admitted I was powerless over alcohol and that my life had become unmanageable. And he says, well, aren't you stupid? And I'm like, what are you talking? I'm taking everything offensively. You know, he's like, what's that? What it says? He says, read it back. He says, how it's written out of the book. And, you know, we admitted we were powerless. It was the we for the I, right? And it was the we and the hour in that, in that line. And he goes, now go read it the way it's written. And then we'll talk about it. And I got in my car and this was probably the first experience that I had with things that like my thinking doesn't work. And I get in my car and I'm like, okay, I'm going to read it the way it's written. This is about as dumb as it gets. Like this ain't going to make the difference. What kind of stupid... And I says, you know, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. And I did that twice. Third time, something changed. Something clicked. I can't tell you today what it is. Something clicked. It bought me that extra day. I don't know what it was. I called them frantically, ecstatically happy. And I'm like, you're not going to believe this? And, uh, you know, it's kind of like what Wade does to me. It was like, Oh, okay, weird, you know, and then it's all I hear. I'm like, well, that's sad. I'm looking for like cake and ice cream and the whole thing, you know. Um, <laughs> so my, my understanding of God at this point was God, okay, and it was good orderly direction. That's what I came up with. I knew that I had came out of something that has no direction, if not complete opposite direction, and that God to me, um, wasn't a terrible thing, wasn't something I had any God trauma over, um, but at the same time, it was good early direction because for me to accept anybody bigger than me at this point was impossible. Um, I knew my thinking was screwed. That was about as simple as it is now, but, but I can make my own decisions now that I'm sober, right? You know, and then we got to step two and came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And, and that's wonderful, you know, and, uh, I believe that I've seen that happening in these meetings, and I believe that I've seen that happening in people that I had talked to. Um, I didn't know who my God was yet, you know? And I'll tell you, for me, respect, brotherhood, always played the biggest role in my life. I can look back and say that the things that I wanted from others, I wasn't even to them at that point, right? Today, I could say it's much different. Um, but you know, at the third step, I remember with Wade and wherever he's at, um, we were on a, on a, on a uh, retreat and he, we get down on our knees and we say the third and seven step prayer. And we all sit around the altar, right? It's a church that's connected to the, to the, to the villa. And you know, it, I want to read this because at this point, it still was God to me, I promise you. But it was, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Believe me, or relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help with thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. 
And that's a, that's a one-step prayer. And it, the, the second part of that prayer is in the seventh step. It says, my creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, right? Good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which strands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. Right? And that gives me tears in my eyes. I remember how powerful it was when I sat with him in a brotherhood with, with arms over, right? And it gives me tingles. And it was something special and it was new and it was great. And it was a brotherhood that I wanted for so long that I ha thought I had, but this was real. And so it was real. Um, you know, and, and, and from there, of course, I could go to all the steps. I got like a minute and a half left. What I, what I will tell you is this, is that there was a point and there's so many other stories that God showed up in my life during these steps, during going to meetings, the struggles on a daily basis. Um, and I remember I found my sponsor dead, and I, I thought that was it for me. I just did. He died. He drank himself to death and everything else. And that and it was the next night that we're going to a meeting at Sherman Hospital. There's always anybody that knows that meeting. There was 60, 70 people there on a, on a, on a Saturday or Sunday. I believe it was Saturday. And, and I said to God before I walked in, and I said, because I didn't know if I wanted to stay in anymore, right? I had just lost somebody who I loved dearly, who took their life to, to, to dedicate to try and help me. And now he's dead. And, uh, and I didn't know if I had, I didn't have the power myself to stick around. I didn't have the will enough to want to still be here. And so I remember when I walked in that meeting, I said, God, if you're real, I says, then I'm going to win. They give out this, this little ticket when you walk in and there's 60, 70 people there. And they, that one person picks out the ticket at the end of the, a little kid usually picks out the ticket to know if speaking to me. And I says, if God, if you're real and if you want me in your life, that's what I said, because that's about how ignorant I am. And uh, I says, then I'm gonna win this one ticket. So basically setting myself up for failure. I was ready to go out that night. And I remember vividly, right when the speaker ended, and the little kid walked up, and before he could pick out the, the ticket, I, uh, I felt something go through my body. And I looked over the next person next to me, and I says, I just won the damn book, you know. And he's like, what are you talking? I says, here. I threw the ticket out. I said, watch the number. They ain't even started reading the number yet. And I'll be damn it. Boom, 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 boom. And I won that ticket. And, you know, I can look back today, and I can tell you that that was super, super powerful for me. Um. It, it bought me another day, right? That's what it did. It truly bought me another day. Um, in the end, from there, of course, you know, these signs that I had taken and some of the stuff, and I did start going to church, and I started going to Westridge, and it was a comfortable church for me. I was able to kind of do my own thing. Things weren't pushed on me. And slowly but surely, I can tell you today that there's been so many situations, um, but when I got married or was going to get married, <laughs> and I had been sober for a few years, um, I knew that it was time for me to ask, right, at this point, who I knew and had been studying was about Jesus, right, in the Bible. And I wanted to ask him to come into my life, individual, I want Jesus in my life, right, because that's what it was for me at that point. Um, and I did, and I got saved over there at Westridge. And uh, since that day, and I'm out of time, and that's the only reason I'm really trying to wrap it up, because Chuck's got a good story too. Um, but since that day, I can tell you that it has not been perfect. Um, things aren't wonderful every day. But what I can tell you is that I committed to one thing, is to know that Jesus is in my life, okay, and that God is in my life, and that he's never let me down. So out of this whole journey in sobriety, and my little one driving me nuts, and me struggling, and me doing this, and going through marriage, going through a divorce, going through some of the worst pain, the up, the highest of highs, that I promise you, I tell people that I would go to the top of the Sears Tower and scream it, right? That God is real and that he will be there with you and that he's been there with me and he's, and he's held me up when I thought I was gonna fall, right? And the things that I worry about that are frivolous, that mean nothing, or the financial difficulties or this, it's constant. That there's always just, here, I can fight it for a week, and then I stop fighting, and here's the answer, right? 
And, and I can fight for a week and watch 10 of the answers fly by me. Today, I can tell you that my life, and especially with here at Rock Bottom, and I think that's the most important, so two more minutes and then I'm gone. And <laughs> that's what I'd tell you. But from the time I walked on this property, it's been something different to me. The guys on this property enhanced this times 10. And everything that's happened on this property, right, has been, been, been messages from God. And it's been great. And this, to the simplicities of the things that we buy that fit perfect in a section that we didn't even plan to put. Um, and the way this has come together, the relationships that we've had, um, the growth that we've had. And I'm extremely grateful to be here. I don't want to take up too much time because I guess I'll just probably keep going. Um, but I am blessed today. You know, I do thank God. I do love Jesus. I have been saved. And I don't push that on my guys all the time because I know how it was for me. I would have ran away, right? But what I can stand up here and tell you is that my story led down that route, right? And I do love Jesus today, right? You guys don't hear that a lot from me over there, right? But, but the reality is not because I'm hiding it, because I don't want to push somebody away that can find it all on their own because he's seeking us out. Let me promise you that. Um, today's a good day. This property is awesome. I love Act Like Men. I love James and my brother Chuck and uh, and Sharon and the rest of our group. And, and we plan on doing good stuff for you guys. And uh, I love you. That's what I got. So I'm Chuck. We're covering addict, addict and alcoholic, but I do find my identity through Christ Jesus. And I say that would always say that because I didn't know who I was until I found Christ. All right, I didn't know that I was an alcoholic and I didn't know that I was an uh, addict. But let me tell you, so the way I grew up was totally different from Bobby. I, you know, I had a mother and I had a father, but my father beat on me. My father taught me how to drink when I was six. I was getting high by the time I was seven. I was out there running the streets at eight and nine, and uh, I got in a lot of trouble. I broke the law a lot of times. I didn't listen to anybody. I listened to myself because I thought I was God, okay? Because I was raised that a man don't cry that a man don't worry about stuff, that a man goes out there and takes what he wants. And it don't matter whether it's yours or mine. Most of the time it was yours. I would go in there and I would steal it from you. All right. I would take what I wanted. And that's the way I was raised. That's the way I did things. I just took what I wanted. And I lost a lot of friends. I lost a lot of relationships. I lost myself. I never knew who I was. I thought I knew who I was, but I didn't know who I was. And then I went and I had a little stint. When I was 15 years old, I was with another guy. And uh, we decided that we were gonna rob this taxi cab driver. And we went up to rob him. He went to get a gun. I ended up stabbing him. I ended up running. So I did what they call a BI special at Okeechobee Boy, Okeechobee Boy School in uh, Okeechobee, Florida. And I did a BI special, which is a year and a half. All right, and that was the start of the very turn because I was a gladiator school. And I'm gonna tell you, it was the worst time that I ever did. The worst time. Now, I did a lot more time after that, but that was by far the worst time. We had riots there every day. I saw young men getting stabbed every day. I saw men getting killed every day. Young boys, because we were just boys. We thought we was men, but I seen a lot there. When I got out of there, you know, I did a little message. I did a little stint in the Marine Corps. I ended up getting kicked out of the Marine Corps because, you know, I they can't tell me what to do. And I ended up punching one of my COs, and that put me out on Um Came out of the core, now I'm bitter. You know, I made it through basic training. They taught, they, they broke you, they break you down and they mold you into the way they want you to be. And uh, so when I came out of there, even though I got kicked out, I had an S on my chest. I was even better. I thought I was better than I ever was before. I learned how to do things. And um, I went right back to, I was right there still drinking. I found my, with my first marriage, you know, I got her pregnant. And what does a Southern boy do? Southern boy says, you know what? You got to marry her because you knocked her up. And it ain't that way today, but that's the way it was back in my day. And uh, so I married her, didn't love her, thought I loved her. I married her because I got her pregnant, thought it was going to work out. And then she had another child, but I was out there running and rolling. I was not a good father to my children, not at all, because I was selfish. I was selfish. I was chasing the drugs. I was chasing the women. My kids didn't come first to me. My wife didn't come first to me. What came first to me was my selfishness. Me, me, me. It was all about Chuck. And it was all about getting high. It was about going out and drinking. It was about who I could talk to today and who I couldn't talk to tomorrow. What could I, how could I make the next big buck? I have 
an older brother and I have a younger brother and they're both dead today. My older brother died from cancer. My younger brother died from the disease. And as a lot of you guys know, my son just died from this very same disease. And it killed me when my son died. I could not make up to him what I took from him. And I took me away from him. I didn't know who I was. I did try. I tried hard. It just didn't work. But I realized he was an addiction. And he was so angry at me no matter what I did or how I, my life changed and he saw my life change. It didn't matter. But I know he's in heaven because he did find the Lord. He might not have been walking with Christ, but he did find Jesus. And once we're saved, we receive salvation. That salvation doesn't go away. We might not be in the same part of heaven, but that salvation don't go away. Growing up, I lived in fear. So my stepdad was very, my real father's Cherokee Indian, so I'm Cherokee Indian. My real father was an alcoholic as well. Um, he beat on my mother. The last memories I have of him was calling, uh, back then it wasn't 911, it was zero because he was beating my mom. And I called zero and I got scared and I hung the phone up. Nowadays, if you do that, the cops will be at your house. Back then it wasn't that way. I was out in California, San Jose, California. And um, so my mother left him. We went back to Virginia because that's where I was born. And um, she met another man. His name was Larry and he ended up being my stepdad all the way up until the day he died. And I'm gonna tell you, he was the most brutal man that uh, I, anybody could ever come up under. He did things to me and my brother and to my mother that nobody should ever go through. He took a dog one time, he told me and my brother, I was seven or eight years old, I was probably eight. So we had two dogs, he told us to go pick a dog. Now if somebody tells you to pick a dog, you think, okay, he's giving one away. Well, he didn't give that dog away. He made me bring it inside, made me put papers on the ground, started to choke the dog, dog bit him, then he took his knife out and he cut that dog up right in front of me and my brother. Made me pick the pieces up, put it in a plastic bag. I'm crying the whole time. That's why I told you I lived in a spirit of fear, always. And because uh, if he could do that to that dog, what is he gonna do to me? What's he gonna do to my brother? What's he gonna do to my mother? My mother worked overnights. So my mother came home the next morning, I'm crying, I'm all upset. I take her, because we lived in a trailer park. That was a real trailer park. And um, I put the bag in the dumpster to where when she came home, I could get that bag out and show her what this man had just did while she was gone. She didn't want to see it. She didn't want to believe it. She didn't even want to hear it. My mother chose another man that wasn't my biological father over me and my brothers. And that was the, I can see today, and the only reason why I can see it today is because the Lord shows me everything now, because I'm sober. Um, I can see the day, you know, that that was the day that my whole, my whole heart, my whole life changed. Because how can your mother deny something like that, right? But anyway, so obviously I kept on living and um, went in the car, got out of the car, had my kids, got my kids going, got in trouble again. I had to do three years over that stint. And then at that stint, and then when I got out of there, I, I was always I was doing a little better, uh, but I was drinking, I was drugging. That's all I knew. That's all I knew. I knew how to run from. I knew that 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 drug and that alcohol took every all the pain away from me, all of it. I didn't have any pain when I was doing drugs and alcohol. Well, I find I know today that that was that was I was running from my own self, right? I got out, I was out a couple of years, about a year and a half. I decided, you know, that some crack and everything was running wild. Everything was hitting the scene. So one of my friends said, hey, you need to try this. And I tried it. And uh, it's good to see you. Roger, is that you? Yes, sir. It's good to see you, brother. You anyway, so I'm good. I tried. I started trying crack and, uh, and, and I was drinking. It really wasn't my thing, but I'm gonna tell you, every time I drank, I went back to that drug. And um, I ended up robbing banks to support that. And I did it with somebody else. Ended up getting, you know, I got in trouble again. And uh, they offered me 30 years. Anyway, long story short, the 30 years got dropped down to 11 years. And I took the 11 years and I did those 11 calendars. When I got out of prison, I listened to everybody asked me a lot of times, well, Chuck, didn't they have religious services in there? Didn't they have AA groups that come in and stuff? I did not want to be fake. Because one thing about me, I'm not going to be fake. I'm either all in or I'm all out, right? I saw it. I was judging everybody else around me. 
Those guys that were going to AA meetings were coming back drinking the same hooch that I was making. All right. Those guys that were going to church services were coming and having homosexual acts and all this stuff in there and doing the same things that a lot of these other guys are doing. So why would I want to do that? Why would I do that? I know today that those people's hearts were golden. Okay. I know that today, but I didn't know all that then. I did not want to be, I did not want to be fake, but actually I was fake because I was playing a role all the way up until I got sober. I met my wife when I moved up here. I got out of prison. I wanted to be closer to my kids. My ex-wife said, move up here. We're, we're going to try to work things out, right? Well, my oldest son had been getting into some trouble. He was on probation. I came home. He went. He was fighting with his sister, and then he was fighting with his mother because my son was a lot bigger than I am. And I uh, came to the house, put it out. What, you know? Then his pro probation officer comes over, and that day she told me, the only reason why I brought you up here is to send you back to prison because that's where you belong. So I left her. I, found, I met my wife here and I left her. It wasn't nothing to do with her. Had a little old lady, Mama Marina, I call her. She knew my background. She knew her story. She was watching me and my wife date. And she said, Chuck, you guys need to come to church. And I was like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. Because see, the problem was I was angry at God. I was angry at God because how could he let me have parents like this? How could this go on? How could I kept blaming him for every single thing. Even the choices that I was making, I was blaming on him. Why don't you come to church, Chuck? Why don't you come to church? So we decided to go to church because I really, I wasn't, didn't want to go to church for any more reasons than to get her off my back. And uh, so I went to church. First time, I didn't feel anything in me. I just wanted her off my back and that's probably what it was. But I can tell you, so we didn't go back. My wife and I were starting to have a few issues. I said, hey, let's see if there's a harvest somewhere in our area, a church in our area that we could go to. And um, that was in April, 2010. We walk into the door. We sit down, we're welcome, we walk in the door and we sit down and my pastor's up there on the TV screen. Uh, that was the day I found Christ because it, he was in, listen, the word is this TV screen, right? <clears throat> Can't see me. I sure thought he was watching me. He started sweating. I didn't know what was going on with me. Uh, my heart was being convicted like you just don't even know. And I wish I could remember the message, what the message was that day. I was too busy worried about what was going on in here. And um, I was working the fourth step, getting into my fifth step at that time, they had a party at the pastor's house. So I had asked to do my fifth step with one of the pastors, right? And uh, he didn't know it at that time, what he was doing. But, you know, I had prayed that day, but I just wanted to solidify, you know, where I was going. That, that day, I accepted Christ Jesus, my Lord and Savior. I surrendered. I surrendered it all. I was crying like a baby. Everything was coming out of me. And... Um, fell on my knees. I'm yours, God. I, I was so humble because I was so angry at him. And all that anger went away. All the pain that I was feeling inside was starting to move away. And I became a new man. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if any man come, come to Christ Jesus, he behold, he's become a new creature, a new creation. The old man has passed away and all things become new. Right, so I'm baffled. Okay, now how does this become new? I can tell you how it becomes new. You guys that come to Bible study, I got, you hear me all the time. What do we do? We build a firm foundation, right? We discipline ourselves and we get into the word and we listen and we pray and we trust in Jesus. And I started doing all that. I came to Christ just like I came into these rooms. I shut up and I listened. If they asked me to do something, I didn't even ask questions. I just went and did it. That's where I found my identity. That's who I am today. There's nothing more joy to bring joy to my heart and seeing my granddaughter who's following in my steps, who's preaching the word of God. You know, it just, it, I, that is who I am. God has laid it upon my heart to help other people, to help other men that are suffering and have been through the same things that I've been through. Right? And I help men that have never even seen a bad day in their life. I would have never thought that would have been possible in a thousand years. But it's true. I get into the word and I believe in the word. I told my guys at work the other day, I've been with Julasco for 20, almost 23 years now. And I was having a meeting and I told him, I said, listen, fellas, I got three Bibles that I follow in my life at this time. The one Bible I'll always follow through the rest of my life to the day that the Lord calls me home. And then I'm worshiping and praising him and hanging out. It's going to be awesome. But I follow the Holy Bible. With this in the Holy Bible, and it's true, it's always true. It is the word of God. I'm going to follow that. If God says that, it's good enough for me. 
And I told these guys, because I was having a meeting with them, and I said, there's two more Bibles. While I'm at work, that I have to follow. That's a pilot procedure and a contract. As long as I'm doing those, I'm not doing anybody any wrong. All right? Those men at my job, when COVID started, so a lot of you guys, you know, there's a lot of HR stuff that goes back and forth at the time where I can't, I can't come right out and ask a brother that I see that it's on my job that's suffering if I can pray with him. So I have to figure a way out around it, right? COVID came around, I was outside in a prayer group with all these guys that knew who Chuck Blanton was. They all came, God drawed them there. Everybody was scared, but we found hope, we found relief through Christ Jesus every day. That's where I find my strength from. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus. Now, when I first read that verse, I got, okay, well, what is it that strengthens me? I didn't know what strengthens me. Was it my wife? Was it that? No, the Word of God strengthens me. And as long as I follow the Word of God and I practice the principles of the A steps through Christ Jesus, I put Christ leads me to follow the steps, which leads me to be the best man that I can be through Christ. I can't say anything more than that because I know that I find my identity through Christ. That is who I love. And Christ loved me back. I didn't know that before, but he does love me back. I can look back today. He's opened my eyes so much to so many things that I can see where he was working in my life with all the bad that I was doing. Because I shouldn't be here today. I should be dead multiple times over and over and over again. I should not be here. And I ask God, I pray about that at times. And then you guys know what happened to me in July. And I'm still here. God has a purpose. He wants a relationship with every one of us. We have a loving father that wants a relationship with his creation. He created all of us in his image. And I don't care what our color of our skin is. I don't care what the color of our hair is. I don't care if we're tall, small, fat, short, whatever. God created us in his image. We are his children. How much greater is he going to take care of us? When you can look out at the deer, and I like to hunt deer and eat deer, but you can look out at the deer, the birds, trees, and his creation that's all around us. He takes care of that. But he didn't create them, they, all that in his image, but he created us in his image. So know that and understand that Jesus Christ loves you. He is the way, the truth, and life, and there's no other way into the kingdom of heaven except through him. When I really believe that by working these 12 steps, it led me to open my heart up and that's how I found Christ. I received the gift of salvation. I used to thump my chest. Look at me, boy, I received Christ on this day. Then I'm reading the book of Ephesians because remember what I just said, build a firm foundation. Read the word of God, come to him in prayer, surround yourself in a community of fellow believers, people that are just like you, that have the same goals, right? And uh, he's gonna show you the way. I plead that with all my heart. It's done time and time and time again. This is the reason why I do the things that I do today. Somebody asked me one day, why well, Chuck, why do you do this stuff? What if I was that one guy? What if Christ died for everybody else's sin but said, hey, Chuck, not you. What if that would happen? It didn't, thank God. But what if that's, that's my way of saying, this is the reason why I do the things I do. Christ didn't have to die for me. I was not worthy of him. I'm still not worthy of it today, but yet he did. He said that I am his son and I have a father now that's not gonna have me drinking, it's not gonna have me drugging, it's not gonna have me being the violent man that I used to be. But believe this, just because I love the Lord doesn't mean I won't protect my family. I don't ever wanna have to go back to being the man that I used to be and then through Christ Jesus and practicing these 12 steps and living a clean and sober life, I never have to. That is the promises. That is the promises. But God, had mercy on a wretched sinner such as I am. He loves every one of us in this room. And if you don't have a relationship with Christ, open your hearts up, allow him to come in and watch how your life changes. You guys hear me say about what? Reading the book of Proverbs, I challenge the guys all the time. The book of Proverbs got 31. Read one each day for the month. Go back the next month and read it again. If you can't come to me and tell me the word of God is not alive and well, then I'll tell you I must be silly. Because I'm telling you that every time I open God's word, he's showing me something else that I've never seen before. That's called alive. His word is alive and he's moving. The spirit moves all the time. I love you guys. I'm grateful. I love Jesus. That's my mentor right there. I love him with all my heart. I love my sister Sharon. I love my brother Bobby. I love the guys in the rooms. 
God has given me an opportunity to share back what the miracles that he gave me. That brother right there, I watched him almost die two years ago. Came out of the hospital in two days. That is a miracle, fellas. If you'd have seen that wreck that happened in front of my eyes, that's a miracle right there. God is alive and well, and I love you guys, and I'm, I'm done. I appreciate both Bobby and Chuck sharing their stories, and uh, you know, I don't have a uh, dramatic story like the ones that they have. My story is very different, and uh, I was uh, raised in Ontario, Canada, near Toronto, and uh, I got a picture of me as a four-year-old coming out of church with my uh, brother, and he's holding my grandfather's hand. I'm holding my great-grandfather's hand, and my brother's got, my father's got his head in between my uh, two, my parents and my grandparents, and uh, I mean, that's my background, is always going to a church that loved God's word and preached the gospel, and I but uh, going to the right church doesn't, of course, make it so for you. And um, I remember in February of 1967, so most of you were not even on planet Earth at that time, but <clears throat> I was at a church on a Sunday night, and I remember hearing the good news that Christ died for our sins, and if we would believe in Him, we could be forgiven, have a clean slate, just a clean slate, and God would help us start over. And... Uh, they had an invitation and people went down front and they gave their lives to the Lord and I was afraid to go forward. You know, we're singing a song and I was just a kid. I, did, I wanted to go down there, but I was afraid and we were walking out of the church and I said to my dad, Dad, I want to go down front. And he said, no, we're not doing that. He says, we got to get home. It's getting late. And uh, I was, so I sat in the back seat in a final display of depravity and I was so, you know, upset that he wouldn't even want me to do this. What do you bring me to this church for if you don't even want me to give my heart to Christ and so we got home and I can remember going into my bedroom and taking off my special Sunday clothes and you're supposed to always hang them up I just threw them on the floor in my closet in anger and put my pajamas on and stomped out into the kitchen where my mom and dad were drying the dishes and I said why don't you want me to, to be saved and they just looked at me like what well, of course, later I figured that my dad just thought I wanted to go run around the church like I always did. He didn't really understand what was going on inside me, but I'll never forget my mother taking I've always had a red Bible because my mother had a Bible just like this, the same color, and she took me into her room, and I could see her hands right now. She's been with the Lord since 2010, but she opened the Bible, and she um, shared with me the plan of salvation, how we can turn from our sins and embrace Christ by faith for our forgiveness, and I prayed that prayer with her and gave my life to Christ. I was, uh, as I said, seven years old. And um, I mean, I could still take you to the exact place where all of that happened. But you know, I'm not uh, a child anymore. And looking back, I've said now for years that that was when um, I took hold of the Lord, but uh, I didn't give the Lord control of my life. He, I, I wouldn't let him. He, he took hold of me, but I didn't really take hold of him. And I was, I was a pretty bad kid in high school. I was failing most of my courses. And I mean, I can remember in high school, I didn't really want to follow the Lord. And I smoked pot every day. Like, I mean, every day, every day, every day, every day. I can remember taking a biology test where we were supposed to draw and label the parts of a flower. And I drew like a stem and sort of a daisy with a happy face, which wasn't what they were looking for. <laughs> and, you know, and then I put eyes and nose and mouth and just sat there and laughed about that because I was so high. And then there was the next question was, what is a node, which is that little green part when a stem is starting to reach out? And I wrote down, I don't node. <laughs> and then I laughed about that for about 45 minutes and turned my paper in. And that's the kind of high school student that I was. I mean, the idea of me having my doctorate back then, let me just tell you something, that would have been the biggest laugh of the day. But when I was about 17 years old, a new youth pastor uh, with the name of Marvin, of all people, but he was a loving man. He came to our church and he just started investing in me and just, he didn't care if I was there, didn't, didn't treat me like I had to get somewhere, just started loving me and caring for me and ministering to me. And, hey, I'm gonna go visit some kids after school. Do you wanna go with me? And I was like, well, I'd do anything to hang around this guy. And then, then we'd be out there and we'd be meeting with a kid and the kid would tell some story that was breaking his heart or some awful thing that he was going through. And 
I'd be so convicted because I was so rebellious against God, but I, I didn't have any of those problems. And so then he'd say to me, well, you, you, when we get to the end of the meeting today, you got to be the one to pray for him. I was like, I don't know. I, I can't pray for nobody. I, don't I mean, I remember I thought it was so weird when people said, God bless you. I literally thought that that was lunatic. God bless you. It's like, what? who freaking does? Who says stuff like that? And I was like, I didn't want to be a pastor. I didn't want to be that guy. But he just got me serving the Lord. And it's quite a long story. But eventually he uh, challenged me. And there were the, the different churches in the area used to have competitions, you know, playing the trumpet or um, telling a children's story. And one of the competitions they had was a preaching contest. And you had to have a little 10-minute sermon. And I mean, the first year I didn't even win it because you had to cut your hair. And it's hard to believe now. But back then I had so... Anybody remember when they had a lot of hair? And I, I had so much back then, and so I said, I'm not going in that. That's stupid. Cut your hair. That's the dumbest thing. And by the time the next year came around, I think the styles were changing more or something. I don't know what it was exactly, but I just decided, okay, well, I was going to do it. I just I thought it was kind of on a dare, you know. So I made up this little 10-minute sermon from the Bible, and uh, I won this competition with all these kids. Nobody could believe it. And then my pastor had me preach it in the church, and then... I, I went to another kind of North American competition and, and did very well. And it's just like I could see God was using me to do this. I'd never had the feeling before. If you've never had the feeling before, like Chuck referenced it and Bobby referenced it, to see God start to use your life. To be like, I might be here for a reason and, and uh, you know, I did a lot. Of, so I went, eventually I went to Bible college. Uh, Kathy and I dated for five years and got married, and I was in college, and I thought, well, I didn't want to be one of those stale pastors. Never wanted to be that pastor, that guy, you know, with the hollow, uh, you know, the hollow forehead and the soft palms. Never worked a day in his life. That guy. I never wanted to be that guy. And a lot of the ministers, candidly, that I had known just didn't have the man thing down. And it was very hard for me to relate to that. I was like, well, I'll work with students. So I get on staff at this church working with students and we're ministering to students and, and I thought that was a great thing, but um, the pastor of the church would get sick like twice a month and he'd call me on Saturday night, you needed to preach. And I'd scramble together and get something together. But what the weirdest thing was, was I'd spend two hours working on getting a message together and God would bless that like this. And then I'd spend all this time working on all these other things and it just seemed, when you, when you notice in your life, when I do this, it's like there's wind in the sails and awesome things happen. But when I do this, it doesn't matter how hard I work, nothing good really seems to come from that. So I just was more and more doing that and I decided that I wanted to come to seminary to get a master's degree and more training. If you're gonna spend your life studying a book, you better get some more tools. And so I came here to Chicago and while we were in seminary, I prayed, God, I'll go anywhere you want me to go, but I, wanna, I wanted to pastor one church for a lifetime and have deep relationships with people. And so we started a church here in this area in 1988, and it grew beyond what anyone could have ever thought or imagined. And I was blessed to have a ministry on radio and television that was heard in every English-speaking country in the world every day. And I was blessed to write 15 books and and um, do men's conferences all over the country and speak to tens of thousands of people in arenas and all of it. But increasingly, I was really, really miserable inside. I had no joy in it. I was overworked and overutilized and over, over, over everything. And I really kind of lost myself in it. And I lost... Um, just my sense of myself and being a healthy person and living a balanced life. And you know, you can be addicted to serving the Lord just like you can be addicted to alcohol, just like you can be addicted to uh, porn, just like you can be addicted to a lot of different things. When you come to have to need something to the point where it's unhealthy for you and it's hurting you, but you can't stop doing it. And so I could tell a lot of stories about what people did and what people said and but we've been working on forgiveness, and I told you one of the things is, is I won't bring it up to others, and I'm uh, seeking to live in forgiveness about those things, even as the legal process plays itself out for some of the wrong things that were done uh, to my wife and I. But I would just say that I took about two years after I very, very violently was removed from that church without ever meeting with anyone, without ever having any accusations brought to me, and we were pretty devastated, crushed, actually. 
and uh, 10 of the top leaders in the church were taken out at the same time as us, and it, it just was a very, very devastating thing. And um, But I took about almost two years um, until I really got in touch with Chuck and got in touch with Bobby, and they were really the kind, I was so disillusioned with people who claim to be Christians, but they don't love, and they uh, don't commit, and they don't know what it means to be brothers. Now, if you look at the back of this jacket here, and it says, Act Like Men, that's a book that I wrote, Act Like Men, but you'll see at the bottom it says, Love the Brotherhood. And as I thought and prayed about it, I just determined that I wanted to work with less people, a lot less, but I wanted to be deeper with them and get to know their stories. That's why we're giving you a chance to know ours. And they wanted to have authentic brotherhood with other men, where we knew what it was to be committed to one another, and we knew what it was to forgive and forbear and keep on going. And for those of you who are in our addiction houses and those of you who have gathered around us, that's what we're offering. We're inviting you to join in with us and go as far as the road will take us in the direction of, you can count on me, I can count on you, we will be there for one another. Amen. Come hell or high water, as they say. And uh, it's easy to find people who will sign up for the ride when everything's going great. But the way that we bail on one another when things are going bad is just so, so wrong. So I'm thankful to be living out uh, an opportunity to um, uh, experience and to offer to others authentic brotherhood and like these other guys, I skipped a whole lot of stuff uh, in those stories. But uh, Kathy and I now have nine grandchildren. She's out with them tonight, actually. And, uh, and uh, we have two sons who are both pastoring their own churches and uh, a daughter who loves us and loves the Lord. And uh, I have a ton to be grateful for with the people that are serving here with us. And we really are here for you. We get up every day and we are about what you need. And there is a really authentic thing that's happening here, and I'm glad that you can be part of it. And as you know, this teaching goes out over the internet all over the world, and there's people that love, have loved me and my ministry who support what's happening here. People you'll never meet have given so that you could be free from addiction and find the Lord and live a life in God that is everything you have always hoped your life would be. I liked what Bobby said, you know, just come at your own pace, and uh, figure it out as you go, but we're here for you and we're not planning to be anywhere else and hopefully this will be something that you can really rely upon in your life. So let me just pray for all of us. Father, we're grateful to hear uh, these stories. They're different, but they're the same. They're the same in this. The life brought us all to realize that we don't have uh, what we need to get to where we must go and we thank you, God, for intercepting each of our lives in a different way at a different time. We thank you for your sustaining grace. We thank you for your uh, faithful provision for each of us. And I pray afresh what was mentioned already. I pray that this property and all of our houses would have such a sense that there's something more, something different, something deeper going on here. And I pray by your grace that we could have the experience of seeing men set free and set back with their families and on a new path with a foundation in you, Lord. And so help us to those ends as we try to figure out how to do this authentically. But what we do, we do for you and for your glory. And we thank you for this time together of telling our stories. Thank you that at the center of our stories, there you are. And we give you thanks now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I mean, isn't that awesome uh, to hear people's stories? And uh, our stories are also different, but I hope you have the common denominator that we all have, which is an encounter with Jesus Christ that changed our life. It took us from being uh, angry, frustrated, self-centered uh, people. And more and more, as, as Chuck, I think, quoted the scripture, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is passing away, the new is coming. And uh, man, I thought I'd be a little further along in this growing in Jesus thing that I am. There are things I didn't think I'd still struggle with that I do, but I sure love the Lord more than I ever have and love his word more than I ever have. And as I said at the outset,
Uh, you know our stories now. We'd love to know yours. And uh, so you'll see on the bottom of the screen there um, an email address. And if you would take the time to write out your story, I give you my word. I will take the time to read it and pray for God to bless your life as you continue to grow in Christ. We'd love to hear from you. Write your story down, send it in. And uh, it's just such a powerful thing to commit to words what God's been doing in your life. We'll see you next week.